refused to do this talk because she didn't say enough nice things about me. So <laughs> I thought this was going to be a two-hour introduction. What's going on here? <laughs> so uh, I was going to. Uh, she talked about my telling stories as a lawyer, and I always try to explain that the difference between being a lawyer and a writer is that when I was a lawyer and I lied in court and made stories up, they threatened to disbar me, and now I do the same thing. Everyone says how great I am. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice thing. So March uh, 9th, uh, 2020, uh, Reasonable Doubt, my 23rd uh, Robin Lockwood novel came out, and I was at the uh, Poison Pen in Scottsdale, Arizona, talking to a group about this big, and there was something in the newspaper about some bug that was uh, getting people sick and killing people. Uh, the next night, I went to uh, Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and uh, there was a, a crowd, but it was a lot smaller. And then the next night, I was in Dallas at the, I think it was the third largest bookstore in the country at a ticketed event where they told me they had sold a lot of tickets for this and five people showed up. Um, then I got on a plane to go from Dallas, Texas to New York City for something that was not a book event with 36 people on the plane. And then my publicist said every other um, talk has been canceled. So that was the Last time, with the exception of one uh, talk I gave here last year, let's see, the last time I, I spoke to humans. And so I'm just absolutely thrilled to have humans instead of uh, a monitor, which I really, I don't, I've done some Zoom stuff, but I really don't like it. So I really, I just love this. Now, I've, I've done um, book tours. I love book tours. I really enjoy getting out. Uh, as a lawyer, you're always in court with people, and when you're not in court, you're sitting down bitching about judges and DAs with other lawyers. And you know, but when you're a writer, you I, my at least for me, I sit in my I kept my law office to write in, but I I have to put the shades down and I have to shut the door, and all I do is I stare at a a monitor um, for say four to six hours a day. So there's no real human contact. So that's why I really enjoy the, the book tours because I actually get out to meet people and talk to people. Uh, <clears throat> I did, uh, I guess the longest one I did was uh, uh, 26 cities in six weeks all over the US and Canada. I've done six in Europe, which are really fun. It's really, I, I always get a kick out of this. They, 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 my agent will call me up and say, well, your Italian publisher wanted you to know if you'd be willing to have them fly you to Italy, all expenses paid. Uh, they know you're very busy, and would you be willing to do this? Well, how many nanoseconds do I have? <laughs> and then I've done them across Canada. And what I find interesting about the book tours, I always, and I'm going to do this here, is I give a talk about some aspects of writing, and then I take questions from, from people, which is my fun. I really enjoy the questions. Uh, and whether I'm in Oslo, Norway, or, or Ottawa, Canada, or Oklahoma City, I get the same questions. And the three biggies are, since you were a full-time criminal defense lawyer for 25 years, how did you become a writer? Uh, how do you write? Do you use you know, a computer? Do you have a system? Uh, do you do outlines? And then the third one is, where do your ideas come from? So I'm going to talk a little bit about all of those. And then, like I said, I'll take the, any questions. I've got a couple of movies made, if you want to talk about movies or something about publishing that I didn't touch on. I really like the questions. So how did I get published? Well, when I was in the seventh grade, as a result of an overdose of Perry Mason novels, I decided that I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer when I grew up and do murder cases. And for 25 years, that's what I did. I did 30 homicides, 12 death penalty cases got to argue in the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, everything that Perry did in the books, I did in real life, and the only difference between me and Perry Mason is that all of his clients were innocent. Mine, not so much, so. Uh, but as far as, the, uh, as far as the writing goes, and this is true, it never entered my head until I actually got published, which was in my 30s, that I would ever write a book. 
and the reason is I'm a, I'm a voracious reader. I still read a, a two to three books a week. And I started doing that in elementary school, and I was in awe of writers, and I couldn't imagine writing a book. It seemed like impossible. So uh, the way that this actually happened was I went to college, and I went to West Africa and the Peace Corps for two years, came back and worked my way through NYU Law School going nights. I was teaching um, uh, <coughs> full-time in the South Bronx, which was the junior high school, which was the highest primary area in New York City at that time. So between having a full teaching schedule and a full law school thing at night, I had enough time to eat and breathe, and that was it. And then a wonderful thing happened my last year. To get through what in three years like the day students, I went summers to catch up on the missing credits. And my wife graduated from college and got a job. So I didn't have to teach that summer because she could pay the money for the rent. And I had a job waiting here in Oregon uh, clerking for the chief judge of the Oregon Court of Appeals. So since I had a job, I just had to get D's in my classes to get out. So I wasn't really, I had three classes, I wasn't really going to cl uh, class very much. And I had all this free time. And I never had free time, because I always worked. I mean, starting when I was in elementary school, I had a paper route. I was always doing something. So this was the first time I actually had a free summer. And I decided that I would try to solve one of life's great mysteries, at least to me. And that was, how do these guys fill up 400 pages with words? I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I opened these books and said, where did this guy think up all this stuff? So uh, the most I'd ever written was, you know, some school paper of about 25 pages. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try to write a novel, not to get published, because I had no idea how you'd do that. I didn't know about agents or publishers or anything. Uh, <clears throat> I certainly had no encouragement that I could be a writer. The only course I'd ever taken was a C plus in creative writing my second year in college. So it was just, I thought it'd be interesting to see, could I write something more than 25 pages? So I decided to write a novel based on my African experiences. And so it took me a couple of years. Um, when I finished, it was 187 pages, so I was very proud of myself. It was more than 25. Uh, but when you're a lawyer, you're trained to be very objective and unemotional about your work. And reading my book, but emotionally and objectively, I realized it really wasn't very good. So I, I never made an attempt to get it published. However, I loved writing. I liked creating a three-dimensional world where everything worked exactly the way I wanted it to, unlike real life. <laughs> so in real life, I'd be in court, and the judge would say, well, Mr. Marlin, I, I've read your motion, and uh, I'm going to deny it since you applied to die. You have to say, thank you, Your Honor, thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> then I could go home and write a chapter where that happens, and as soon as the judge denies the motion, a samurai would come out and <laughs> cut his head off. <laughs> Blood would come streaming out of his neck, and he'd die horribly in pain. If you're, if you're a writer, you don't have to take Xanax or, <laughs> or go for therapy, you know. Uh, it's just really uh, cathartic. If, if someone pisses you off, you just kill them in the most hideous, horrible way you can imagine. Really feel good. So anyway, so I, I started writing. I wrote some science fiction short stories occasionally. O always got rejected. And then uh, when I was in my mid-30s, I already had my own law practice. Uh, I had actually done a couple of murder cases. And uh, they say, write what you know. So I said, well, maybe I should write a crime story. So <clears throat> I wrote a, uh, I wrote a short story, a crime short story, sent it into Mike Shane Mystery Magazine and forgot about it because months went by and nobody from the publisher sent me anything. Then uh, one day I walked into my office and there was a stack of mail and, and I'll never forget this, in the middle was a gray envelope with black raised lettering from Mike Shane Mystery Magazine, which I assume was a rejection letter because that's the only communication I'd ever had from a publisher, but this letter said, Dear Mr. Margolin, we wonder if you'd be willing to accept $65 from us to give us the honor of publishing your story. And my immediate reaction was, these guys are really stupid. Because if they negotiated with me, I would have paid twice that to get into print. <laughs> this is like the most amazing thing that ever happened. Some, some big national magazine was actually paying me for something I've written. 
So that gave me some self-confidence. Now, my whole writing career has been really bizarre. And the bizarre stuff started when I decided to uh, <clears throat> write a serious novel based on a case that I'd come in contact with when I was clerking at the Court of Appeals. Uh, the, the real life case that I decided to fictionalize was the Peyton Allen murders. And I wonder, does anyone here remember Peyton, we got, you're very old. <laughs> old people like me don't remember Peyton Allen. Uh, this, this, this is, in my personal opinion, the single most amazing murder case in American history, not just Oregon history. I mean, it's, it was in the courts for 20 years. Don't ask me about it because we'd be here another couple of weeks. But literally had everything and the kitchen sink. Um, and I had, when I was working on some of the briefs in the case when I was at the court, I thought, well, if I ever decide to write a real serious novel, I'll see if I could fictionalize Peyton Allen. So it had always been in the back of my head. Uh, well, I started working on that. I had five chapters in an outline written. And I get a call from Marty Bauer. Now, Marty was a guy that uh, had roomed next to me at NYU Law School my first year. And then by the second year, we had a couple of classes together. And by the third year, I got married. He, he, he was taking different classes. And I, I really hadn't seen him for about five years. I had no idea what he was doing. And uh, he called me up and he said he would like to come out with his wife on vacation to Oregon from New York City, where he's, where he's living. I said, great. I said, why don't you stay at my house and I'll take some time off from work and I'll take you out to the gorge and up the Mount Hood and stuff. I'll show you the sights. So he came out and he's on the, in the car driving from the airport. And I asked him the question any one of you would have asked someone you haven't seen in five years, hey Marty, so what have you been doing? And it turns out that Marty was one of three lawyers at the largest literary agency in the world. And I said, Marty, I'm writing a book. And Marty said, oh shit. He started screaming and trying to claw his way out of the car. So actually, it was very nice. I explained to him I had no writing experience. I had this one course where I got a C plus. I didn't know really what I was doing. I was just doing stuff, writing. And I said, could you take the five chapters back to New York, give them to someone at the agency, and have them call or write and say, hey, this is fantastic, keep going, or it's you know, really awful, stop. So Marty agreed, he took the five chapters back to New York, and I went on practicing law. Well, a couple of months later, I was in uh, court, and we recessed about 5.30, and I got back to the office assuming that everybody would have left. And instead, they were all sitting around with champagne. So I thought someone had won a big case or something. So I said, what happened? And they said, well, your agent call, which I didn't know I had. <laughs> um, Marty was a really, he's an interesting guy. But what he's done, he liked the five chapters. So he asked a guy named Jen Mattis, who uh, had, he, he was an apprentice agent. He'd been a secretary to an editor of Pocket Books and decided he'd rather be an agent than a secretary. So he was just learning the trade. He was, you know, bringing coffee to the real agents and opening up their mail and stuff. And Marty said, my friend in, in Oregon wrote this, see what you can do with it. And he got the bright idea of showing it to his old editor of Pocketbooks. The next thing I know, I had a book contract. So for those of you who don't know, it usually does not work like that. <laughs> usually writers go through years of suffering and rejection before they get published. And I don't care that I did. I, it doesn't bother me. I don't feel the least bit guilty, <laughs> but it's sort of just, like I said, my career is bizarre. It just sort of fell on my head. So I wrote a couple of books. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people ask me, you know, how do you, what is your writing process? So I mentioned the outline. Uh, what I do, <clears throat> and I, I did this, I wrote my first five novels with a full-time uh, law practice and raising two kids. So I had to figure out, you know, how do you do this in a small, limited amount of time? Uh, now that I've, I've been writing full time since 1996, I still use the same system. So if there's any of you that are thinking about writing a novel, I'm going to tell you everything I know about writing. You know, the first thing I do is get an idea. And that for me is the hardest thing. Writing for me is really easy. Once I 
get going. It's, it's, I mean, it's not the least bit difficult. But an idea is this big, and a book is this big. So getting an idea that's complicated enough to fill up the, a big book is really difficult for me. And <clears throat> uh, I, there's a lot of stuff I do to, to, to try to get those ideas, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I literally will not write a word until I know the ending of the book. So if I get an idea, but I can't figure out how it ends, I will not write it. Now, just to show you I'm not lying, uh, in 2000, no, pardon me, 1995, I got an idea for one of my most successful books, Executive Privilege. Could the President of the United States be a serial killer? And I thought it was a fabulous idea. I had all sorts of, you know, I knew who some of the characters were gonna be and some of the scenes and stuff, but I couldn't figure out how the President has the Secret Service around him all the time. He's got uh, the press following everything he does. How could he get away with a murder? And uh, uh, so I didn't write anything, but I kept on a little file and I get ideas and I throw them in there. And then in 2006, I was driving back from uh, Black Butte where I have a place and uh, my wife and I had been on vacation. I had just finished the book and I was trying to think what I'd do next. And I got this brainstorm. I said, oh my God, that's how I end that president book. So, so it took me 10 years and I just would not write until I knew how things were gonna wrap up. The reason for that is the ending, in my opinion, is the single most important part of any book. How many of you have seen a movie or read a book that was fantastic and had a really stupid ending? So what do you tell your friends? Hey, I just read this book. It was okay, but the ending was so dumb. You forget you love that book. You are glued to that book. But if it's a bad ending, it spoils it. Flip that over. How many of you have read a book or seen a movie that was okay, but had an amazing ending? What do you tell your friends? Oh, my God, when I found out the butler did it, my jaw, I couldn't believe it. You forget, most of the book really wasn't very good. So that ending, it's the last thing that the reader leaves with and so for me it's really important especially since i'm writing mysteries i have to make sure everything is tied up at the end and makes sense so okay now i've got my idea and i've got my ending and the next thing i do is a very lengthy outline which takes me i want to say one to three months and i'm doing this you know six hours a day and i talk myself through the whole book from beginning to end now, I always advise people that want to write, once you get that idea, do not write, think. And then once I start working on the outline, I'm not writing, I'm thinking. Because it's not a book anymore, it's, it, yet it's this outline. So I'm spending six hours a day just thinking about the plot. And what's good about that is a lot of the stuff I thought was fantastic, I realized, it's not really gonna work that well. And other stuff, I realized, oh, I have to have a different character. Uh, I didn't think I needed a third character here, but I really do. So as you're thinking about the plot, it's growing and growing and growing, and you're getting more scenes, and you're getting more complications, red herrings, clues and stuff that you can put in. So once I get the outline done, then basically my whole book's written. It's just in shorthand. And I take each paragraph and I make it into a chapter. The, <clears throat> the finished product, the first draft is always gonna be lousy. Your first drafts are never publishable quality. There's some great stuff in there, but there's also a lot of bad stuff. So then after I've got that, what I call a 400 page outline done, then I spend months uh, editing for quality. And then once I've got it where it's fantastic, I send it to New York and they beat the hell out of me for a couple of months with all their editorial suggestions. So, but that's, now you know everything I know about writing. That's, that's all I do, I do this with every book. Uh, so ideas, where do ideas come from? Well, this is the most fun because they come from all over the place. Uh, in my office, right next to my desk where my computer is, is a bunch of cubby holes. And two of those are taken up with idea files. 
And every time I still subscribe to law journals, I read the newspapers all the time. Uh, anytime I come across anything that could possibly be uh, used in a book, I copy it or cut it out and I throw it in the idea file. And then when I finish a book, <clears throat> I take that whole big idea file, I usually can't do it all at once because it's big, uh, and I spend uh, probably a week reading through all these articles, putting ones aside that might be of interest. The, the book that's coming out, I've, I've actually put, before I, about two weeks ago, I put to bed The uh, Darkest Place, which is the next Robin Lockwood that's coming out next March. And <clears throat> I got the idea for a good part of that uh, by going to a uh, seminar on the coast that was put on by Oregon Film and Defense Lawyer Association on shaken baby syndrome. It was a junk science uh, seminar the last couple of days. And so I got a couple of ideas for books. And I have a whole big trial of shaken baby syndrome um, <clears throat> where people, a person be prosecuted. So I will get stuff like that and I'll go through and say, oh, okay, this thing is something I think I can use for a book. Uh, so <clears throat> sometimes I will get the idea from an article, newspaper article, my first book, Hearthstone, my fifth book, The Burning Man, were based on actual murder cases, one that I tried, one that was very famous. Uh, that's a great, if you're, again, if you're thinking of writing, using a real case is fabulous because you have so much material that you can use to make it realistic. When I did Hearthstone uh, back in the 70s, I had friends at the uh, Attorney General's office because I used to argue cases against them. And I came, came back, they gave me two full suitcases of thousands of pages of trial transcript and briefs and everything from that case. So it, I can make things sound really realistic just by using actual testimony that you, you know, rework into your fictional book. Uh, sometimes they just pop in your head. I was walking down the street in um, Seattle on a book tour and the phrase the courthouse athletic club popped into my head. Why it did, I have no idea. But I thought, huh, that'd be a good title for a book, but what would it be about? So I said, well, a club is a bunch of people that get together to do something, and so it was a conspiracy, and I'd never written a book about a conspiracy. So I said, well, what kind of conspiracy would it be? Well, courthouse, maybe it's a conspiracy between uh, judges and lawyers and policemen to do evil things. And so that eventually, uh, after thinking about it for quite a while, became Ties and Bind, which is about lawyers and judges and <laughs> police officers who are doing evil stuff. So sometimes it just pops into your head. Now my favorite all time uh, story of where I got an idea from, I was in uh, St. Simon Island, Georgia, keynoting a writer's conference. And uh, <clears throat> St. Simon Island, for those of you who don't know, is a very swanky resort island in Georgia. And there was an uh, area called the village. And in the village, they have boutiques and art galleries and restaurants. And before going over to the, uh, to the writers' conference, I, I got breakfast at Palmer's Village Cafe. And that, that cafe was owned by an art gallery dealer. So all of the walls were decorated with oil paintings and watercolors and photographs uh, that you could buy you know, they were for sale. And uh, <clears throat> after I ate my breakfast, it was a really good restaurant too, uh, I went into the bathroom to wash up. And over the toilet was this photograph, which I think is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And if you look at it, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it's a woman in a wedding dress. She's standing at the ocean right where the waves come in and then recede. Uh, you can't see her face because she's looking out in the ocean. And what makes this really interesting is behind her back, she's holding a really big gun. And I thought, what is going on here? Did she just kill her husband on her wedding night? Uh, is she going to kill herself? Is she waiting for someone to come in on a boat that she's going to shoot? So I ran, I washed my hands first, but then I ran out. And uh, I told the guy at the cashier, I said, I want to buy that photograph. So I ended up buying the photograph. 
And uh, then I wrote a book, and in the book, uh, a young woman who has just gotten the MFA um, has come to New York City from the Midwest to write the great American novel, because her professor told her that this short story she wrote was fantastic and should be expanded into a book. She's got writer's block. Nothing's working. She's got a menial job as a receptionist at a huge law firm, and she's bored to tears. And one uh, lunch break, she goes to the Museum of Modern Art, and they're having a retrospective of the works of the photographer that took that picture. And in the book, that picture won the Pulitzer Prize. And <clears throat> the woman there was married to a guy who was murdered on his wedding night and the mystery was never solved. No one ever figured out who the killer was. And so she decides to leave New York, go to Oregon and try to write a novel based on that case. So uh, art imitates life. <laughs> so, that's, so that's where I got that idea from. So uh, again, they come from all over the place. And uh, the idea for my newest book, uh, A Matter of Life and Death, uh, <clears throat> came from the fact that I, I did uh, 12 death penalty cases. Trying a death penalty case is a real specialty. It is completely different from any other kind of law case, civil or criminal. And that includes regular old murder cases. A death penalty murder case and a regular old murder case, completely different animals. And uh, there's specialized case law that you never get involved with when you're doing a regular old murder case. Uh, there's, I mean, it's just so many different things. And I thought it would be interesting to write a novel uh, where Robin Lockwood, my heroine, uh, was trying to, uh, was handling a death penalty case just to show how you do it. So it's not boring, there's a lot of action and stuff and uh, mysteries, so it's not like a lecture on how to do a death case. But, I do go all the way through on it. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, a lot about Robin Lockwood, I thought, uh, usually I don't like to read from one of my books because I figure if you've read it already, it's boring, you know, and then if you haven't read it, it spoils it. But I was on a um, panel at a Arizona, a huge Arizona writers conference, and uh, they put me with two literary writers. and. They said they, they wanted each of us to read something from their, their current book. And I just, I don't like to do it, but then I, I realized that the first uh, six pages uh, from The Perfect Alibi, which was the book that had just come out, uh, is a great introduction to Robin. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this uh, so you get a little idea of who Robin is, and what she's like, and then I'll open it up for any questions you guys have. Uh, okay, at 5.30 on a rainy Monday morning in October, <clears throat> Robin Lockwood ran the five miles from her apartment to McGill's Gym in Portland's Pearl District. For decades, the Pearl had been the home to dusty, decaying warehouses. Then the developers moved in. Overnight, most of the grimy, rundown buildings were replaced by gleaming high-end condos, trendy restaurants, and chic boutiques. McGill's was on the ground floor of one of the few old brick buildings that had escaped gentrification. It was dimly lit and filled with the rank odor you'd never found in modern air-conditioned workout emporiums. Barry McGill, the gym's owner, was taciturn, monosyllabic, and profane. Rumor had it that he had mob connections, but people with any amount of common sense were too wise to ask him about it. Salt and pepper stubble sprouted on McGill's fleshy jowls and whiskey reddened cheeks. He'd fought as a middleweight in the 1980s and had the broken nose and scar tissue to prove it, but his days as a 165-pounder were long past and the weight he carried in his gut, butt, thighs had elevated him to the heavyweight division. <laughs> Lockwood, McGill called out when Robin walked in. Yeah? See the kid slacking off at the heavy bag? A young man in his early 20s was hitting the bag with lackadaisical punches that barely made it move. Robin judged his weight at welter around 147 pounds, slightly more than her 140, and she couldn't see an ounce of fat on him. That's Mitch Healy. He just won his first two MMA fights and his head swollen. Want to take him down a peg? 
Robin was five foot eight inches with a wiry build, blue eyes and high cheekbones and short blonde hair. She'd earned some of her Yale Law School tuition fighting in mixed martial arts matches and had been ranked as high as ninth nationally. Her straight nose was a testament to her defensive skills as a cage fighter. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, <laughs> Robin said that that kid's a man and you just told me he's in training. I never took Robin, Rocky Robin for a pussy, McGill said, referring to Robin's ring nickname and the old rock and roll song Robin's fans would sing when she walked into the octagon. Screw you, Barry, Robin spat, snapped back. Hey, I wouldn't ask if I didn't think you could give him a hard time. Robin gave McGill a hard stare. He raised an eyebrow. Robin sighed. Are you going to cover my dental work, he, she asked. Hell no, McGill answered. You always were a cheap bastard. McGill grinned and Robin went to the locker room to change. Hey, Mitch, McGill shouted when Robin returned. Yeah? Come on over here. I got you someone to spar with. Healy looked around as he walked over. Are they in the locker room? Yeah, she's right in front of you. Healy looked at Robin. Then he laughed. She's a girl, Barry. Hey, that's a brilliant deduction. You're a regular Sherlock Holmes. I'm not sparring with a girl. You see anyone else around? You've been dancing with that bag for the past 20 minutes. Might as well dance with a flesh and blood female. Hell, maybe you can give her a couple pointers. Healy hesitated, then he gave Robin the once over and shrugged, all right, let's go. Now Robin had stopped fighting professionally after suffering a brutal knockout on a pay-per-view card in Las Vegas in her first year of law school, but she was still in great shape. Robin could see that Healy had no respect for her, which meant he would underestimate her. And when they got on the mat, Robin started moving like a beginner, flicking out slow, sloppy jabs. Haley, Healy looked bored, and he pawed at her, her unenthusiastically. Robin moved a little closer. Healy threw another lazy jab. Robin slid past it, spun behind him, threw one arm through his crotch, and encircled his waist with her, with her other arm. Then she grasped the encircling arm with her hand that was between Healy's legs lifted him, and lifted him in the air. While Healy thrashed around, she aimed his head at the mat and drove him straight down. When he hit the mat, Robin wrapped her legs around him in a figure four scissors and slapped on a chokehold. Healy struck her for a while and then tapped out. Robin ro rolled off Healy and jumped to her feet. Healy sprang up. He looked furious. Robin circled the Healy charge. Robin counted on his anger, clouding his judgment. She sidestepped the charge and landed a shot to Healy's jaw that would have unhinged it if she hadn't pulled the punch. Healy stumbled and Robin snapped a kick that landed beside of Healy's head. She pulled that kick too, but it still sent Healy sideways. All right, that's enough, McGill shouted. Robin bounced out of range and Healy glared at her. I said that's enough, Mitch. Now why don't you start your workout again and let's put some effort into it this time. McGill rarely complimented anyone, but he nodded at Robin. Next month's a freebie, he said, as she took off her headgear and headed for the weights. Who the hell was that, Haley asked. That's a girly girl who just kicked her ass, McGill answered. Healy watched Robin for a second before turning back to McGill. Is she single? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. That's a good, uh, and then the reason I made a Robin, uh, I had a re reason for making him or her a professional fighter. It, I, and most of it, you heard, a lot of my books have very strong female characters in the lead. They frequently will get in dangerous situations. And uh, in real life, it'd be, most of the time, if a man and a woman fight, the guy's going to win. Uh, bigger upper body strength and a bunch of other stuff. So I thought, well, if Robin gets in a fight and she wins against a man, it would make sense because she's a professional fighter. And in a lot of the books, this, what happens is she will get into, in, into it with somebody, but they don't know she's a professional fighter. We'll, we'll just make assumptions that uh, don't work out well for her. So, uh, so I'd love to take any questions. Uh, like I said, about, uh, I think I have allergies, so my nose runs constantly. Uh, any questions you have about anything, publishing, writing process, uh, like I said, I've had a couple of movies made out of books. What, whatever interests you, interests me. Yeah? Why do you have strong female characters? Why did you make Robin? Oh, so that's a funny story. <laughs> so, 
Uh, when I wrote Hearthstone, it actually did quite well. And uh, my editor at Pocket Books asked me, and this I was in my 30s, okay? And he asked me, he said, would you uh, want to write a series for Pocket Books with a woman prosecutor? And I just panicked. I said, I couldn't write a book with a woman as the main character. You know, I, could, I can't do that. So I didn't take him up on it. So then uh, my second book also had a, had a male main character named David Nash, who was a lawyer. Well, I had a, about a 12 year break between my second and third book because the same year my first book came out, I, start, I argued the US Supreme Court, and in between the two books, I started doing major murder cases and all the stuff I wanted to do as a kid. But in 1992, I got an idea for a third book at a dinner party, and uh, I decided it would be fun to have a third book. And in, in this book, it's a, it, there's a serial killer who, who does horrible things to women. So I had a scene, I was gonna have a male main character, and I, I had a scene, and in this scene, David Nash, I brought him back from Last Is the Man, is meeting with this guy who might be, who may or may not be a horrible serial killer in, uh, in a high-rise building. It's late at night after everyone except for the cleaning crews are gone. It's a really spooky scene. But I've represented serial killers. And <clears throat> anytime I'm in a contact visiting room with someone who's killed someone, your antenna's up a little bit, but if the, the person you're with kills women, I know I'm not his type, so the tension's a lot less. And so I thought, in the scene, if it's a guy in the room with someone who kills women, the tension level's gonna be here. So then I thought, well, what if it's a woman lawyer? The, the tension level's gonna be through the roof, because you've got this woman who fits the profile of the women that are getting killed alone, late at night in a high-rise office building, and she's the only one there except for maybe a cleaning crew, a couple of floors below. <clears throat> so then I said, uh-oh, I gotta do a sex change on my <laughs> character, but I was terrified. I said, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna write a woman? And then I thought, who's the toughest guy I know? And my wife, who was a, was a lawyer, was the toughest guy I knew. So I said, oh. I said, what I'm gonna do is every time I write a scene with Betsy Tannenbaum, who's a fictional heroine, I'm gonna imagine Doreen, my wife, in the scene. And then I, it was a great crutch. She got me through over my fear of women. And I realized it wasn't really that difficult to write, write a strong woman character. So I don't, I don't uh, have a woman character as the lead in every book. And I've, been, I've been actually been accused of pandering to women because more women read mysteries and stuff than men. But what I do is I decide you know, on the plot and then is a man or a woman the, the best person to carry the plot. So in, I would say that more than half of the books I have a very strong woman uh, as the main character. Uh, but not always, it, you know, it just depends. Some, case, some of the books, a male works better. So that's my long-winded answer to your <laughs> short question. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Um, I know you live in Portland, but your um, your speech pattern accent is all over the country. What's your okay? I grew up rest? I grew up in in uh, New York City and uh, Long Island, New York. So Manhattan and Long Island, uh, <clears throat> as you can tell, you that Long Island. Uh, <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, so I sort of get it. I okay. <laughs> Yeah, so what happened was, uh, I did my Peace Corps, I was, I was two years in Liberia, West Africa, and I did my Peace Corps training um, in San Francisco, which is really weird. Now they, they do the training in the country. Training for Liberia, West Africa, in San Francisco is like training for the moon in Hawaii. It's like, <laughs> makes no sense at all. So my, whoops, my daughter was in the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic, and she trained in the Dominican Republic. They, they have training centers now in the, in the countries you go to. Uh, but I had never been off the East Coast. And I went to uh, uh, San Francisco and just fell in love with the place. I, I remember walking around the first time and saying, oh my God, it's a big city and it's clean and beautiful. How did that happen? So my, my plan was uh, two years after, go back East for law school and get the hell out as quick as I could. And I, 
literally took my last law school exam on my kitchen table in Salem, Oregon. Uh, landed here in 1970 and never went back. And then I actually didn't even go back to New York for 12 years, but uh, um, I love it out here and I just can't. There's two kinds of New Yorkers. New Yorkers who wouldn't live anywhere else and New Yorkers with common sense, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I guess uh, your, is there some overlap between your active practice and your writing success? So uh, did it ever come up in the courtroom where jealousy, where like, okay, Mr. Margola, this isn't one of your novels. <laughs> <laughs> No, but there's a couple. There's a, there's a, a couple of lawyers that embarrassed me by mentioning the fact that I was a published author when they were picking a jury, which, which is legit. I, you know, I, I couldn't get. I was embarrassed, but I really couldn't, you know, object because it's a legitimate question to ask. Usually, the the, the what I was really happy about was how supportive everyone in the legal community was. You know, they were really nice about it. Uh, the first time. I went on a book tour, uh, and this is the reason I switched over from being a full-time lawyer to full-time writer. Uh, <clears throat> I, I was, I was at, gonna be out of the state on a book tour for God Have Not Forgotten, that was a, the first uh, bestseller in 93. And the DAs and the judges were really nice. They said, oh yeah, yeah that's fine, we'll settle for the cases, and we think this is great. So they were really, really nice. And, but I realized I could go that well at once. I couldn't keep on asking the entire judicial system of the state of Oregon to go on a hold while I went out and hawked books. So uh, I made, I had about two years worth of cases. My, I didn't know if I'd be a one hit wonder too, because there are a lot of guys, they write one book and it's huge and it's fantastic and then the rest of their books they don't sell. So I didn't know if I'd ever write a second bestseller and I didn't know if I liked being a full-time writer. I'd only, only done it as a hobby. I'd never done it as a full-time job. So I had two, two years worth of cases. I stopped taking cases. I figured after those two years of worth of cases ran out, I would know one way or the other, A, whether I was gonna sell any other books. Or, and by the end of the two years, I had five New York Times bestsellers and uh, really liked the writing as much. I love being a lawyer, but I always tell people I love that being a lawyer. A lot of people say, oh boy, you must have been relieved to get out of law. No, it was really fun. I really liked it, but um, I did it for 25 years, and it was nice to have a new job after 25 years. So that's that's the answer. Any, yeah? You uh, wrote a book with your daughter. Oh yeah. You know, well, she's, she, my daughter's, a, she's the exec director, a development director for Girls Inc. in Portland. Um, we, this was a really a publishing strange. So I got a call from my agent and she said, uh, one of, I was with Harper Collins, said one of the, the editors at the children's division of Harper Collins is a huge fan and wanted to know if you were interested in writing a young adult novel. Well, I really wasn't, and uh, I, but I mentioned it to my daughter, and she said, well, why don't we do it together? And I get along really well with my daughter, I thought that'd be really cool, so I said, fine. So we wrote a book called Vanishing Acts, got really good reviews, uh, but they didn't do any promotion on it, and we got a huge advance, that was the weird deal. They got a huge advance, and usually if they give you a really big advance, they really promote the book. Well, we didn't do anything. And then we wrote a sequel uh, to that book and they didn't want it. So I, it's a mystery what went on there. I gave, gave my daughter all the, all the money. I think I kept like a little bit, but I gave her you know, all of the advance and everything. So it was really weird. So we want, I wanted to do a series with her. And like I said, we had the second book all written. The problem is that we'd have to do the second book with another publisher and they wouldn't want to do it if it's a sequel to one that so my agent said, you know, that will, wouldn't work out. They would want to have both books. So that's, you know, I still to this day have, have never been able to figure out what the hell happened. Because like I said, the book was, I think it got nominated, or we won some kind of award in Oregon that they give out for the YA books and stuff. So, you know, it wasn't like it was a really garbagey book. So that's, you know, that was that. But 
It was the book I've had the most fun writing, I will say that, because it was really great. Uh, the reason it was great is I told uh, Amy, I said, okay, we'll brainstorm the outline and you're gonna do all the writing. I'll edit. I said, so that's why you have kids to do all the work. <laughs> so, so you can sit on the front porch while they, they go out there and milk the cows and you know do all this stuff. So, but it was really fun. Any, yes? We have a couple of family members who are doing some writing and we keep talking about publishing and it sounded like from what you said that it was right place, right time, who you know. And so what would you recommend to somebody who's written a book and now they're writing their second book and how are they gonna get published? Well, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's a very weird, it's really bizarre profession. That's one thing I can tell you for sure. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I would say is just write the book. Now, first of all, it, I've written a couple of books like the African one and a couple other ones that have never been published for good reason. And it's like any other thing. When you start out, you usually, what you're doing is crap. I mean, you know, uh, Serena Williams, the first time she picked up a racket, any mediocre JV tennis guy from, you know, 12th string guy could beat the hell out of her because she didn't know where to stand. She didn't know, same thing when you learn piano, you know, you sound horrible. But the more you practice, the better you get. And that's what I found with the, with the writing. I wrote, you know, numerous short stories before I wrote one that was good enough to be published. And same thing, several, probably two or three books that have never seen the light of day for good reason. Um, and they just weren't very good. But you keep on working at your craft. It may be that you write a publishable book and it gets published, or you might write a great book and it never gets published. I can tell you the fun is in writing the book. Because I, I got as much enjoyment writing the books that didn't get published as I did the ones that sold a million copies. So the, the big thing I always advise people, and this is, they've done studies on this, that first of all, Never write to get published because it's extremely difficult. You do have to get a lucky break. I've had a, two of them, one that led to me becoming an international best-selling author. It was, it was, again, being the right place at the right time. And the other one where I told, told you about getting published, I, having a buddy who I went to law school with. Uh, and then uh, even if you get published, you don't make any money at it. You know, whenever I talk to people about writing, I do high school kids or college kids, I said, never, ever, ever think about writing as a career, because they, they did studies, uh, at least two that I know about, uh, that were 10 years apart. The average published writer with an advance makes $5,000. Yeah, that's below the poverty level. So almost everybody in this bookstore has a book published, has a day job. You know, it's very unusual for people to actually be a full-time writer. So I always tell people that the bad news is it's hard to get published, and even if you do, you're not gonna make any money out of it. The good news is that you can be, uh, <clears throat> uh, you, can, you can be a writer, you can be a, you can't be a writer and do brain surgery and do death penalty murder cases, but you can be a bus driver, you can be a television repairman, you can be a lawyer and write. And so I was telling them, if you like it, keep doing it for fun. You know, just, I play golf, I'm terrible. I have to, have to actually pay to pay, pay money to be allowed to play golf, and I'm not very good. Why do I do it? I'm not getting millions from the PGA Tour. Because I like playing golf, it's fun for me. So I said, if you like it, do it, and then if you get lucky, you'll get published. So there are uh, writers' conferences where they, they ask uh, agents to come, you absolutely have to have an agent. You, it's, it's almost impossible to just send a manuscript into a publisher. They don't even look at them half the time. Most of the publishers won't even look at them. And the ones that do, they put them in the, what's called a slush pile, so you can sort of get an idea of what they think of unsolicited manuscripts, if they even read them. So you want to get an agent, and these uh, writers' conferences invite agents, and so usually have to pay some certain amount of money to get a face-to-face, -face, but it's really worth it. Tell the people who are writing the books, do not do anything unless you've got your book at absolute best that you think you could do, because you'll have the one shot. 
you know, don't get all excited because you finish your first draft and show it to people. Work on it, make sure it's as good as you think you can get it. Put it away for six months and then take it out and see how crappy it is. That's what I always, you know, put my books away and then when I look at them, I say, oh my God, that's not very good. That's why I do the editing for quality. Um, <clears throat> the Willamette Writers is a huge writers group in the Pacific Northwest. Now, I hope they're going back to it, but they used to have every August uh, out by the airport, they have this big two-day conference. And part of that, they invite agents. And these guys are screened, so you know they're legit. They're not, you know, some scam artists. Um, <clears throat> so if they have the book, have them call up or, you know, get in touch with Lamar writers and find out when, when they're going to do this. I know the international thriller writers that I'm a member of, they, they meet in New York and they invite agents. So there are these, you know, if, if they have the book really well, you know, real good shape, try to find conferences where they invite agents and then uh, go and, and pitch, pitch the book there. So uh, look, he hasn't had a chance. The, the second question is $1.25. Okay. <laughs> you have your free one already. <laughs> I gotta eat. So, go ahead. I'm curious when you were trying uh, death penalty cases, did you ever have somebody that you got off that you were sure was guilty or vice versa? Well, unlike television, 90% of the people I represented were guilty. They're always guilty. On the TV, they're always innocent. Uh, in real life, the police are really good and they generally arrest the person who's actually done the crime. Now, I would say out of 30 murder cases, there were two that I was most excited about. I was hired after the individuals were sentenced to life in prison for murder that they absolutely had nothing to do with. And I was able to, um, <clears throat> it took me four years in each of the cases, but I was able to get the conviction reversed uh, at the Court of Appeals and then get the guy out of prison. It took me four years in each case. I hated that case, those cases. You know, everyone thinks, oh, every defense attorney wants an innocent guy. No, <laughs> I always wanted a guy who robbed the bank, they got pictures of him, <laughs> he was arrested and confessed, they had his fingerprints on him. Because then if the guy gets convicted, he's a bad person and he, you know, like, he shouldn't have been doing bad things. Uh, if the person's innocent, the pressure's like mind-boggling. You, know, you don't sleep because if you screw up least bit and this guy gets convicted again and he goes to prison and you know he didn't do what he was charged with you feel just awful so fortunately both the innocent guys got up well, I would say based and I had 25 years of practice I maybe had 10 or 15 people who didn't do what they were accused of doing it's just not like it is on television cops are pretty good they're and most of them are very honest not all of them I, I caught policemen planting evidence and lying and when they did, I was able to use that to get the client cleared. Um, <clears throat> but most of the time, they tried to do a decent job. So, uh, you know, it's, it was very, I was, I was a very pro-prosecution pro defense attorney because since I knew my clients were generally guilty, it was hard for me to get up on my high horse and yell at the DA or, you know, call them a pig or something like that because I knew that my guy really would do the bad thing. But that's, you know, but I have, I've gotten a lot of acquittals for people that I knew did, the, did, that's my job, is to represent my client. So you never, the, the guilt or innocence is irrelevant if you're a defense attorney. The state's got the total burden of trying to prove that your client did what he's accused of. You don't have to do anything. I actually would tell the jury when I was picking the jury, you realize that uh, my client and I can go to the movies during this trial and just show up for the, so we don't have to put on witnesses, we don't have to cross-examine everybody, it's the state's job 100% to, to, they have to put up or shut up. You know, they said he did the burglary, if they, it's their job to prove it, but the assumption is that they messed up and got the wrong guy, so, um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, so, yeah, almost every one of the people that I represented in the murder case had actually killed the guy or the person that they were accused of killing. But I did get a number of them acquitted. So, and in other cases too. But that was my job. Anyone? Yeah. Do you read the work of other lawyers? And if so? Sometimes. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I read about two to three books a week, so some of them are legal thrillers. There's some really good, Scott Tarot's a terrific, he writes really, really good books. He's, he's a way better literary writer than I am, and so I like to read a good book by a good writer. But I, it just, to me, it's, I, I don't look, do genres. I do good books and bad books. I hate genres. Genres are to sell books. Like, it's a science fiction, science fiction book. They give it, say, this is a science fiction book. Well, it could be a brilliant literary novel that just happens to be about it. Like Ursula Le Guin wrote a whole bunch of science fiction stuff. Is also an exceptionally good literary writer. So I, I never look to see it. Someone says, hey, this is, a good book and happens to be by a lawyer writer, I'd pick it up. Thank you. Well, if there's nothing more, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> thank you. That is what, so I, when I talked to law school, I said it's not like it is on TV where, you know, you, you beat up the other lawyer and stuff. I said, the, the, your whole, pro, it's a teaching profession. All you're trying to do is explain to either the jury or the judge, the whoever's making the decision, that your ideas are intellectually superior to the other guys. And that's, that's the job. You have to show the jury that what you think they should be doing is a better idea than what the other guy does. But uh, if the other person is a mean person or a nice person, it's sort of irrelevant. You know. Either way, it's going to be dead is a better idea. <laughs> so, and the other thing is, just recently, I think there are some of us that would have entertained the idea of a serial killer for our president. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the serial killers are generally high IQ. <laughs> and, uh, and very, very creative. Uh, now, sociopaths, something else. Yeah. Yeah. So. We might even entertain that. It just depends on how bad. Okay, so we're going back to doing our drawing, and our top prize today is um, one of Bill's books. And now, if you've been in the store recently, you know that we've had. Well, this is based on the 1853 uh, case, Holmes v. Ford, that decided you couldn't have slaves in Oregon. People don't know this because you always think of slavery in Mississippi, Alabama. You had about 70 slaves in the 1840s, uh, yeah, 1840s and 50s in Oregon because uh, no one knew if we were going to be a slave state or a free state. And a lot of the people who settled in Oregon came from Missouri, which was a slave state. So they brought their slaves here. And uh, so there was, you know, it was really up in the air, are we gonna have slavery here? And this uh, Holmes v. Ford case, which is a really heartbreaking case. It took me 30 years to write this, by the way. But the case itself is really a heartbreaking case, a real life case. And uh, I just uh, wa always wanted to make this into a book and it took quite a while to get it right. So, uh, uh, but I, it's, it's, it, it, I said in 1860, because that's when, uh, Lincoln was running for president, and slavery was one of the big things that people were discussing in that uh, in that uh, uh, election. So. And the year it came out, it was the same year that Greg Nelson did the nonfiction mm -hmm. for King James, and they did their author event together for that. So yeah, the, he wrote a nonfiction book, which is great, about the Holmes v. Ford case. The real, the real. Great book to read. So whoever gets this, they'll have mine. Then I take bribes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, the, the winner is Billy Fisher Fowler. Billy, Billy until recently worked here at the Dorsey's and now she is enjoying her 
free time in reading. Congrats, Billy. Thank you. Where, where awesome. Okay. Okay. And the next prize, next in line, is Winter's Camp by David Wyden. Uh, this is the Native American author that will be on the Zoom call with uh, Craig Johnson for the Zoom event. And the winner is Casey Pareso. Per I, 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 did I? Kevin Pareso. Kevin Pareso, okay. Oh, right. I never won anything. This is Boston today. Number three is just for fun. Welcome to Oregon. Four people share about a line in Paris. The next morning, they wake up in 1954 and have to figure out how to get back. Oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> Have you ever seen Midnight in Paris, the Woody Allen movie? That's what that sort of mind, which is my favorite Woody Allen. It's fabulous. Um, what is it? Marcy? Mar Marcy? Marcy. Um, you need better handwriting. <laughs> you should go back and take penmanship again. Right, and then the last thing? She has pretty handwriting. Uh, the next thing, what's that come on? Uh, three little notebooks so that you can start writing notes. Sure. Or <laughs> list or no, novels. And then you'll be here next year. Everyone who wins this should be here next year having their <laughs> published book. Okay. Uh, BK McCur is it McCurdy? Do we have BK here? No? No BK. Okay. okay. On to the next. Let me just. I thought I had said it about all the Uh Janet Gordon. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Phil is ready to sign uh, books. Oh, she's yes. in the 